Hello everyone. I'm back. Welcome and happy happy 2021. Um quick shout out, happy birthday to my mom. It's her birthday today. Uh and I am Mason Egger and today I will be discussing uh top 10 security practices for protecting yourself and your data. So if you are new to new to my tech talks and new to my streams, my name is Mason Egger. I'm a developer advocate at DigitalOcean. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Those are all the information if you want to get a hold of me. I've got a blog, an email, and I do some live coding streams. Um, I would go ahead and say during this presentation, ask your questions in the chat live. Um, more often than not, with this presentation, because this presentation is a little bit less, uh, it's a little bit more informal than some of my other presentations, I will try to answer the uh, the questions like as I see them, I will try to answer them. Normally with my presentations, they're, they go like they're very streamlined and like I have a plan for them. But since these are top 10, I can take questions at any of the top 10. And if you have a question later, put it in the chat. We'll get to them before the end of the stream. Uh, so today we're talking about a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, a topic that I give a lecture to my parents and my grandparents about this every year at Christmas um, regarding security and internet security and internet privacy. More specifically, protecting yourself and your data, your identity. So there are a lot of security misconceptions in the industry. Um, and the, the biggest misconception that I've seen is, is really this one. It's that this is what a secure system looks like in, um, in, in server land. And in reality, it's kind of not. Like the, the misconception is that security is a castle and that we build it on this really hard to get to rock and we build a wall. And now that we've got the wall and we're uh, built on top of this rock and we're in a castle, no one can get it. And that is the biggest misconception of security of all. This is not what a secure system should be modeled after. Um, and then there's also a very common misconception about what how hackers work and what like, uh, and Hollywood has not helped us in this regard at all. Um, where it's someone who's sitting, you know, in a dark room, brightly lit screens, just banging away at the command line terminal, hacking into your stuff, brute forcing, trying passwords and stuff like that. That's that's really, while that kind of stuff does happen, brute force attacks are a thing that happen. Um, most modern security, like web frameworks, and most modern security frameworks really discourage brute force and it doesn't really work as well. Um, like it's really easy to defeat brute force. It's very easy. Um, so these are just some of the misconceptions when in reality, or it's another misconception is people think, well, what are the targets? Like, I, I want to get this sensitive data. Like I want your banking information. I want, I want your social security number. Like I'm let's, let's get the server. Let's hack into the server. Well, that's, that's, that's actually really hard to do good. We've come a long way in the line of security. Um, there's new exploits and new zero days coming out every day, but like really and truly as a hacker, going after you or going after the server is really not, it's not the most efficient way. It, we could, could they get in and break it, breach the servers? Very likely, yes. It would take a lot of work. It would take a lot of patience to do that. When in reality, the, you're, the, most, pri the most likely target is going to be you. You're the primary target. Um, humans to this day are the weakest link in the security chain. And they, and they pretty much always will be. I mean, think about it. We have all of the security. We have anti-intrusion systems. We have like intrusion detection systems. We have, um, you know, firewalls. We have, we have, you know, randomized things. We, we like really strong SSL keys, these encryption keys, all this stuff. And then the DBA's password is password. Like all of that stuff that we've created is useless because the human factor came in and mess with our security. So what we're gonna talk about today is how you can secure yourself and keep yourself safe um, so that you can have, you know, so that way you can not be the weakest link in the security chain. So what we're gonna talk about today is a, a lot is gonna be about social engineering. So social engineering as defined by, I believe I got this from like, from like a security site is, social engineering is the manipulation technique that exploits human error to gain priv private information access or value or valuables in cybercrime these human hacking scams tend to lure unsuspecting users into exposing data spreading malware infections and giving restricted access to systems and in reality social engineering is how a majority of the hacks are happening these days 
Um, here are some just headlines. Uh, this is going to be a theme of this talk is I'm going to just, to prove my point, I'm going to show you headlines from major news articles of people who got social engineered. Um, the, the, the high ranking, I think the big one that everyone might remember from 2020, the high ranking Twitter hack, when a lot of verified people were claiming, give me Bitcoin and I'll give you more Bitcoin. Elon Musk got hacked. Uh, I think president Obama got hacked. I think Bill Gates got hacked in this, these verified accounts were tweeting this. This was not someone guessing all of their passwords. This was someone coming in and they social engineered an engineer on the inside and kind of partnered with them a little bit from what we've read in the, in the articles, we may have more information now. And they exploited one of the workers and were able to gain access to uh, back-end tooling, tooling with inside the system and then had access to everything. And that's where the misconception of the castle comes from um, in my beginning uh, slide. And that's pretty much what happened to Twitter. Like, I'm sorry, it was sad that it happened, but it, they laid out a perfect example um the like the 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 hardened wall was was secure like the, the external defenses of twitter were were you know are very good but as soon as someone was on the inside it was all like the the, the tool had i don't if i remember correctly the tool had no authentication like you could get in and use dev tools and access production systems so not protecting the inside of your network um is a big way to get hacked because it all you have to do is compromise one person and they get in and then you have you know, vault clusters with no with no authentication, console with no authentication. You have Kafka with no authentication, and anyone can do anything. And um, that's how people get in. And these are just some examples of um, you know of logging in. And it says you know all half of social media logins are fraud because they're meant to steal your stuff. So, okay, so here we go. Tip number ten: when possible. And we're going to, this is going to be a countdown from one, 10 to 1. From They're all very important, but these are my favorites in Mason's order. This is Mason's opinion. Um, use key-based authentication whenever possible. Public-private key authentication is always is and will always be more secure than password auth. Um, unless you have, like, unless you, unless, the, unless this fluent Python book that's sitting on my desk, unless this is your whole password, uh, key, key pairs are going to be better. Um, whenever possible, use it, especially with SSH. If like, if you are running servers in production, in my brain, there should be no password off at all. The root shouldn't even have a password and root login should be disabled, but that's a topic for another time. Um, use public private key authentication to protect yourself. That will help a lot. So now if you have, um, if there's any other systems that you have that use it, always take advantage of this. But then you have to protect that key. So tip number nine, beware of sharing too much on the internet. And this is the one that I get on to my parents. Like my mom shares one of these once a year. So do my grandparents and I have to tell them to go delete it. Um, there's all these little surveys. And the thing is, I couldn't find the one that I was looking for. It's like, how well do you know me? What was your favorite car? What was your first job? What was the first vehicle you in? Where did you go to high school? All of these questions that are like, they're, they're using social media. Let's, let's connect with our friends. Let's learn more about our friends. There's nothing malicious about that. When in reality, these are the questions that you at, answered whenever you set your, whenever you do a password recovery. So like this, this these three over here are Basically, um, these are actually clips from Facebook of people telling you telling you what they had. And then over here, this drop down is a list of some of the most common password recovery options. So this is an example of social engineering. If, and most people don't set their Facebook accounts to private. They're set by public to default. I can go and Google almost anybody, find their Facebook account and find their posts. So now... I know that, and now I can if I know like the if I know them personally, or I can just guess like their email. I might be able to have gotten their email from somewhere else, maybe some mailing list. Um, and now I can guess their password. And now instead of a brute force attempt where I'm trying every possible letter combination, which would take a long time, I now know that with it within a case, like I'm I've been, I've narrowed the pool. It doesn't mean that I'll get in, but it does mean that I am a lot more. Uh, I'm a lot more aware of you and I'm e it's easier for me to be able to social engineer you. This is the one that I get onto people the most about. Um, if you want to tell everyone about everything, call, call your best friend and talk to them on the phone. Don't post it on the internet. The internet is forever. Have backups and be able to restore them. A backup that has never been restored is not a backup. It's a prayer. Um, if you can't prove that, if you cannot restore your backups, um, 
if you cannot restore your backups, then they are not actually a, it's not a backup. It's bad. And this is where we see a like, this actually just, this used to actually not even, I'm not going to say it used to not be a security problem, but it used to be less of a security problem. Um, this used to just be like, you know, your, your, your database got corrupted and now your customer's data is lost and you lose business and that's bad. And you should back up. But with the rise of ransomware attacks, the rise of someone gaining access to your system, encrypting all of the data, moving the key off and saying, give me 20 Bitcoin or you're never getting your data back. And you're not because, the again, these encryption algorithms are strong. They're like that. They're not the weak link in the uh, <laughs> in the security chain. It's still the humans um, with the rise of ransomware attacks. This becomes a problem. So you need to be able to back up, take backups frequently. Now. If you're running a real-time system and you can't take backups that often, that's you're still I mean, you're not you're, you're you'll do the best. You may lose a day's worth of data or an hour or how often you're doing your backups. Backups are expensive in in any state of the mind. In on-prem and cloud backups are expensive. Data storage takes space. Um so yeah, with the advent of ransomware attacks, you have to have backups. So I see we have a question. Are security questions alone a way to recover a password. I feel like there's always together with other ways of identification. Yes, there typically are, but, and again, this is the evolution, but I do every now and then see, um, see, a, see things that only ask me for that. Most people do an email verification, um, but how do you recover your email? If you, like, if you're, if you have a Gmail and you don't have a backup and you don't have a phone, I think you're kind of out of luck. But there are, they might be able to gain access to your email through the recovery questions. I don't know the Gmail one off the top of my head. But while most of them do have two methods and most of them use email and that is better, um, some places still just use it. And if you're designing a system, I would not recommend just using recovery questions, but they have been used before. So that's a great question. Are they alone the only way to recover it? Some websites, yes. Some websites, no. It depends on the site. Um, if I was designing a system that I would never make uh, security questions the only way alone, that would be very problematic. Um, beware of phishing. So phishing is the fraudulent practice of sending emails reporting to be a reputable for reputable companies in order to induce individuals to reveal personal information such as password and credit and numbers. There is a great, great, amazing Simpsons quote from this whenever Homer gets this computer for the first time and he was dealing with all the pop-ups on the internet and he's like, a talking blue moose wants my credit card. What could go wrong? And that's essentially <laughs> phishing. Um, but you have to be careful with emails. Very often, like, you know, I like extended warranty emails, IRS emails. Um, some prince from a foreign country needs help getting, uh, getting claim to the rightful throne. These kind of things uh, are very, are very dangerous and they help you steal Credentials. Um, I I work for comp. I, I think actually I think DigitalOcean does do phishing like tests where they will send out an email that looks suspicious and we're supposed to report it. I know my past companies did this. Um, but yeah, as you can see, Amazon Prime Day spurs spike in phishing fraud attacks because people send emails pretending to be Amazon, and you you don't really check the from, and the from is weird, or you know, there's like Amazon doesn't have two ends. What's going on with that? Um, these are, you have to be very careful of these. So whenever you click on links and emails, um, you have to just like hover over it and look at the link. And unfortunately, because of a lot of marketing emails and a lot of things using third-party softwares like Marketo and stuff now, um, it becomes a lot more difficult. So verify the sender, verify the link. And if you want, you can actually open up the metadata of the email and inspect like, um, the server that it was sent from and all of these things. And you can inspect the deep level of the email. But just be careful um, with with phishing attacks. If if you weren't expecting an email from your bank about resetting your password, maybe don't click on it and, and input your password right away. Maybe do a little bit of digging there. Um, and it says here, Microsoft is the most imitated brand for phishing emails. The Instagram help scam phishing scam filters credentials. It's most of the time with phishing scams, it's about stealing credentials. Um, but even sometimes just clicking on those links may tr attempt to download uh, malicious software. A lot of email clients now have prevented this. This was a, I would say that the, like the, the downloading stuff was a little bit more relevant, um, you know, as in the early, like a while back on the internet, but now uh, most of the time, most of your email clients will prevent downloading, or at least it will ask you, do you want to download going to destroy your computer.exe? Um, you should say no to that. 
uh, yes, always check who the email is from and where the links in the buttons email link out to. Protect your devices and your identity. Uh, encrypt your disks on all your devices if you can. So always, like, uh, Mac has it by default, Windows has BitLocker, Linux has it. Um, always, always, always encrypt your devices. You never know who's going to be able to uh, get in because root access is physical access. Um, when I was in, and, and this is where sometimes like hacking tools are actually not even hacking. Sometimes they're like, they're used as sysadmin tools. When I was in university, I worked in a computer lab and every now and then a computer would disconnect from the domain and we had no way of logging back in or we needed to reset the admin password or something like that. So one of the ways you could do it was with 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 a hacking technique. You could replace sticky keys with command dot with an admin prompt at the login screen, and you hit shift five times, and you gain access. And I, I still do that trick today whenever I accidentally get locked out of a computer or something. Um, so like like these are very easy to find things. Disk encryption stops that because it won't boot without it. But when you have physical access to a device, you have root access, which is why you have to do everything you can to protect the physical devices that you have. Um, how, how do I encrypt disk on the device? Depends on the device. Uh, every operating system has it. Mac OS, you just go into settings, encryption, boom, encrypt the disk. Linux, you set it up when you do the installation. Windows, BitLocker, I know iPhone has it, Android has it. Um, they're native to the operating system now. So, um, and whether or not they're on by default, I think most of them are off by default. You have to turn them on. It doesn't take that long. Like I, this this PC is that I use for my presentations and stuff is encrypted with BitLocker, and it's got a USB drive, and I plug it into a USB, and if I unplug it, you can't boot my PC. So whenever I go on long trips, um, like whenever I'm out of town for a long period of time, I will take that USB stick with me, and no one will be able to boot into my PC. Now, what is the likelihood of someone breaking into my house and trying to gain access to my information? Eh, very very low. But what if you're in an office space and there's desktops and like maybe a Someone infiltrates the janitorial staff, and when they're cleaning up at night, they, you know, these kind of things happen. They sound like they're for movies, but this happens. Um, ensure you're logged off of accounts, especially when using public computers. Log off. Always log off. Like, don't just close the browser, because sometimes the browser keeps you logged in. The keep logged in button is one of the number one ways that people get their accounts um, uh, compromised, because they just leave themselves logged in on a friend's computer or on a public computer. And then someone comes along, changes the password, boom, they've got your identity. So definitely log off. Always lock your computer. Um, like lock it when you leave, when you walk away from your computer. Like I press Windows L. That's the lock key. I would do it right now, but it would probably kick me out. And I don't want to do that. Um, and I almost accidentally did it just from habit. And it locks your computer. And now they have to have my password to get in. Like never leave your data unattended. Um I worked at a company once that actually used to reward that. Like if you left your computer unlocked and someone would take a picture of it and send it to security, like that person would get like a $5 gift card and the other person would be told bad. So like it was a thing at the company. Um, are there harms to unencrypted disks other than physical ones like inside out? Um, are there harms to unencrypted disks other than physical than the physical ones? I'm not really understanding the question, but I'm going with no. Um, encryption is a hard process, and like constantly encrypting stuff will, um, like whenever they do a deep clean on a disk, they like basically decrypt the disk like seven times, or they encrypt it and like zero it out all the time. That can be damaging to the disk. Like whenever, um, like if you want to actually be able to like clear a USB disk, and I think Mac has a tool for this. I've seen it before. Like you like you want it to be like military grade standard of of where it's this has been zeroed out they will zero out the entire disc multiple times um and that kind of amount of stuff can damage the disc it, it, like especially with solid states or with, with flash drives and I, I i'll be honest i'm a little bit i'm actually I'm not a little bit i'm very ignorant as to the, the progression of we've that we've made in flash and solid state storage in the last five or ten years but i know i know that they used to be because they're all capacitors it's a, there's a determined amount of rights now it's a lot of rights but they will eventually just burn out. Um, and if you're doing a lot of heavy uh, cleaning or scrubbing or a lot of heavy encryption, it could potentially lower the life cycle of the, of the disk. Um, I think that's what the question was asking. If not, feel free to retype it in and I'll try to answer it. But that's not really something you should worry about. In reality, like if you're running a production system, 
if you're running in the cloud, you never really have to worry about disk stuff because they're taking care of it. And if you're running on an on-prem, I, I replace my hard drives every three-ish years just for the sake of it. Now, I use the other ones and like other things, but just for the sake of I don't want to deal with hardware failure because I've dealt with massive hardware failure before and it's not fun. Um, I would say replace your disks often. So, will the okay? So another question: Will ah no? Will the encryption affect the? Will the encryption affect the fetching data? Yes, yes, it will. Okay, so this is where, uh, with, like making it, making the access and moving files slower. If the entire disk is encrypted, I'm not sure. Like from the disk level encryption, but like, I would say that, I, I as an educated guess, yes. It, now, how slower will it make it? I'm not 100% positive. Um, it could be negligible. It could be a lot. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons why sometimes whenever you're building a web service, you you encrypt at the load balancer level and you run your search at the load balancer and you let the load balancer do the decryption because encryption always takes compute cycles. Encryption always takes hardware. Am I doing my hair the right way? It's bugging me. I really need to get a haircut. Um, and it all it's there's just a lot. And it's, it's a very, encryption is a very resource intensive. So yes, when it comes to like, if you were looking at clock cycles on your CPU, a hundred percent, you will see, um, you will see that it's going slower. Now, wall clock time, which is how most people judge their website. Oh, this website took me a second to load. This website took me 10 seconds to load what's going on. Um, you may or may not see anything there. Uh, but these, these are the trade-offs. Like this is where like security is always a trade-off between how secure of a system do I want and how much use do I want? The most secure system in the world is the one that's not plugged in. It's unplugged. It's not plugged into the internet. It's in a vault. Nobody can access the data, but it's the like it's got a zero for usability. The most usable system in the world is the system that is in no way has any encryption and everybody can do whatever they want on it. That's amazing. Completely insecure. Very problematic. So you have to kind of find a middle ground. Um, that's why I always recommend, I always recommend when you build services from the ground up, try to include encryption first, like, like include it in your prototypes, because if you get used to a microservice or any sort of service running at a certain speed, then you can benchmark and you can scale to that. But there are a lot of times when, I'm, when I've seen people that have created, un, that have created services that are unencrypted, that have nothing to do with encryption. And they're running at like, you know, X speed and they add encryption and now they're running at. 0.9x, 0.8x. Maybe it could be 0.99x. It could. It just depends on the level of encryption, what the thing is doing. But now they're seeing a performance degradation and now they have to deal with that. And that's kind of tough. So always try to use encryption when you're when you're prototyping these kind of things because it is really going to help you. And then you're whenever you, if you do see a performance loss, you're already aware that they're like, you're not aware of it if you use it first. Like you are, you have already kind of accepted that performance loss. Um, lock your devices, physical access is root access. Another question. Uh, is there effect of encryption if I want to clean install the drive? Like, should I have to turn off encryption first before clean install the drive? No. So say I've, I have an encrypted disk in my hard drive. Um, and I want to wipe it, do a new installation of windows. I don't need to decrypt the disk to do that. You can just format the disk. You can always format an encrypted disk. It will wipe the data. Like it will delete the partition tables. It will wipe it all out and no one will be able to read it. And even so, no one will be able to read it more because it's encrypted. So if you're going to, if you're going to like say reinstall the operating system on your PC and your PC is encrypted and you do not need to decrypt your PC before you do a new installation, you can just format the disk and go on top of it. There should be no problems. Um, if you, at after that point, if you were to take a look and look at like some of the unused sectors of the disk, if you had some sort of tool to do that, um, you would just see gibberish because it would be encrypted. So there'd be no recovering anything from it. So no, you don't need to do that. These are great questions though. Keep them coming. I'm really enjoying uh, this interactiveness of this talk. I love I love doing this. So thank you everyone for all the great questions. Keep your soft, tip number five, keep your software updated. Hello from Germany. Uh, keep your software updated. So the longer a bug exists in the wild, the more likely it's going to be found. That's just the nature of bugs. Um, keeping software up to date on servers and personal machi personal machines minimizes compromise. So um, there's a reason why you don't see people running Windows 7 anymore or Windows XP, or you shouldn't. Um, not only do they no longer get security updates, but they've been around for so long that people have had ample amount of time to find security vulnerabilities. It takes a while to find security vulnerabilities. Um, 
It really does. It, it's not, you know, you don't just stumble across it and go, oh, and sometimes you do. But more often than not, it's a very long and arduous process. And the latest version has not been in the wild as long, so it hasn't had as much time to be exploited. Now, that being said, I understand that sometimes you can't always update to the latest version because of software incompatibilities with software. Uh, like, you know, my I need this library. I need this version of Python. I need Python 3.4. And when I go to Python 3.7, something's broken. Um, I don't know of any use case that actually does that, but that's just an example. Yeah, that, that kind of stinks. But what if what about now? Python 2.7 was deprecated in 2020. Like, actually, not even deprecated. It was deprecated in 2019. It end of life in 2020. Like, Python 2.7 is no longer supported by the Python Software Foundation and is getting no updates. Um and they've been, they've actually, this thing actually, it was deprecated long before 2019. I think it was deprecated in 2010. Like we knew for 10 years that it was going to, that it was eventually going to reach an end of life. Um, sometimes you have to go back. And I mean, this is technical debt. This is technical debt that you have to deal with. You are going to have to maintain software. You are going to have to update packages and it's going to break things and you're going to have to fix it. That's the nature of software. The idea of building a piece of software, putting it out in the wild, having it run and it never needing maintenance again is a fairy tale. Um, it's like a unicorn. It, it's really nice to think about, but they don't really exist. Um, so you need to keep your software updated. That will prevent you from dealing with the nastiest of some of these things. And, um, and yeah, you did that just, yeah, you know, out of date software is putting you at risk. Apple patches, iMessage bug that bricks uh, uh, iPhones with out of date software. Like these bugs, the longer someone has a time, has a chance to play with it, the more likely they're going to find the bug. Okay, tip number four, change default passwords. 15% um, of all Internet of Things devices use the default password. Um, there is Internet of Device password lookers. There are 50,000 home cameras reportedly hacked, footage posted online. Internet of Device takeover surged 100% in 2020 because people are buying these home camera systems. They're buying these baby monitors. They're buying... All of these things, things that allow you to, you know, view your home from the outside, things that are actually supposed to make you feel safe. It's actually funny that a lot of these IoT devices are marketed as security devices. And in reality, like they're security devices to make you feel more secure, but they're actually making you less secure. Um, so you definitely want to change the device. Every device in your home has some sort of password. And if it's open to the open internet, it's likely that people can get in and change it. And then they may not even do anything malicious, but with cameras, they'll just watch and they'll just post the footage online. And that's just creepy. Um, so yes, change default passwords on everything. You should have a password rotation uh, cycle in your, like you should be rotating passwords. But in reality, and we're going to get to this another one. In reality, if you have a strong enough password, that cycle is a lot less than most people's IT companies want to make it out to be. So tip number three, adopt a principle of least privilege. This one is very important um, for, for companies and stuff. You can do this at home. A lot of people don't do this at home. I do this at home. Um, I don't have admin act. Like my main account on my computer does not have admin access to my account or my computer. I have to use, I have an administrator account that I have to enter the password in. So even if someone did get on my personal account on my personal PC, they still don't have admin access because I don't have admin access. The administrator has admin access. Okay, so we have a question in the chat. Before I move on, I will go with this uh, question. How would you explain to your parents how dangerous it is to buy random Internet of Things device and just connect it to their home network? That's a great question. Um, so personally, if my, my parents don't buy these kind of things, I buy them for them and I set them up. Um, they taught me you know, how to read, walk, and do all of these things, the least I can do um, is take care of their digital needs in the future and try to educate them. So basically the way that I tell them is I just tell them the truth. I tell them that a lot of the times there are default passwords that are set. Like the manufacturer needs everyone to be able to get in. It's the same thing um, and and they need to be able to get in. And what they do, and I, tell, I kind of use it in a metaphor of like a house. Like imagine that, you know, everybody has the same key. And when you get to the house, you are required to change the key. And if you don't, whoever, I, I, I compare it to an apartment, kind of, whoever, ha, imagine your apartment complex doesn't change the locks. Whoever lived in that apartment all those years previous has those keys. They could, maybe, maybe they're selling all online. Maybe they were doing some shady stuff. Who knows? It, whenever you get something new, you should always change the locks. You should always change the keys because you don't want to allow people to just 
randomly into your stuff. So that's kind of how I explain it to them. For the reality, I do most of this work for them. Um, I change all of their all of their things, and I, it, it works out for me. So, uh, do you recommend using a password manager? Ugh, that's that's a fun one. Um, I don't. Or well, let me let me let me say this. I personally do not use a password manager. Do I recommend using it? They are very secure. If you are the kind of person that cannot remember very intense secure passwords and multiple of them, then yes, I recommend using one. Um, in my mind, I, I, you know, and I know most of the, to me, they're a single point of failure. If someone were to compromise my password manager, they have every one of my passwords. That's a single point of failure in my mind. Now, a lot of people disagree with me on this. I am in the minority on this opinion, but I luckily am still of sound mind enough that I can remember very long, very complex passwords, a different one for every account. And we're talking like random password generator, like hashes and like, like they're like KCX59237349129 and something like that. That's not any one of my passwords, but, and then I create like a saying in my head and I can remember these like almost hash type passwords. Um, so that's one thing. That's that I do that. I personally have nothing against password managers. In my mind, though, they still seem like a single point of failure. But that's me. I would recommend that if you are not, if your passwords are less than 32 characters a piece, use a password manager. Let's go with that. All of my passwords are 32 characters or more. Majority of the time, they're 64 characters. Um, so the likelihood of them getting in. But if you're using your dog's name and the year you were born with a capital letter at the front because you need the capital letter and all that, um, which is literally going to be the next slide I'm going to rail on that system, um, then yes, please use a password manager. Use something to secure you and use randomized hashed passwords. So anyways, great questions. Loving the questions. And we're actually, I'm running really, I'm looking at the time. I'm running really, um, no, I did not tell you one of my passwords. That is not one of my passwords. Um, I made that up the top of my head. Uh, I'm running, I am running like, normally for those of you that have d done my TikToks before, tech, not TikToks, tech talks. They oddly sound the same. Um, I'm running really far ahead. You know that I normally go over time and I'm actually very much under time. So keep the questions coming. I, and I'm down to just chat afterwards. This is awesome. I'm loving the engagement today. Um, okay. So tip number three, adopt a principle of least privileges. Only those who need administrator access should have it. Um, if your CMO or CTO comes up and it's like, hey, I need root access to the production system. No, they don't. Tell them no. Um, unless you're like a very small startup and like they actually do engineering work. But in like a large company, no, they don't. Um, all resources, tools, data should be behind some form of authentication and authorization. This is what we talked about earlier with the castles method, where once someone gets inside, like it shouldn't just be free reign. Like imagine like you have this castle and then you just leave gold lying all over the floors and stuff because the outer wall will keep them out. My firewall will keep them out. No, there's still a vault inside the castle. There's still guards at the doors. Like you still need security all the way through the layers. So just because I'm inside of your network does not mean I should have privileges or access to everything inside of your network. Um, secure, like, like, so don't be running stuff insecurely inside of the network. Um, unless you need access to a resource, you don't get it. And this, this will hurt people's feelings. Um, and you have to say it nicely, but if they don't need access to it, no, like they don't, they don't need it. Like the, the head of, I don't know, I, I don't know the head person in charge of, uh, the person who takes pictures of the CEO, the CEO's biographer, does not need root access to the production system. Um, I couldn't think of a role. I don't know if CEOs have biographers, um, but they don't need it. They don't get it. You have this is this is how you protect a company. This is how you protect yourself. This is how you protect. This is how you fend off against insider threat. Um, you have to reduce the attack surface of what people can actually access. Um, Okay, so let's see what we have here in the chat. We have, oh, I will change it now also according to the name. Oh, okay, name of my dog. Ha ha, can't still let me. My mom says that I need to put a cactus on the table near the monitor to protect myself. Um, okay, so that's funny, but let me tell you. So you'd be surprised what levels security takes. I'm going to show you one of my levels of security that honestly was not, a, was not intended as a security device on my computer but it has become one and it makes me laugh. Um, I wanted to, to experiment with different keyboard layouts. Like there's QWERTY, there's Dvorak, if those of you that have ever played with different keyboard layouts, that's fine. 
but I also wanted to get better at typing and become a touch typer. So I bought a DOS keyboard Model S Professional, I think, Ultimate. Um, and I'm going to hold it up for you to see. What do you notice about this keyboard? There's no writing. I'm, there is no writing on any of it. It's a completely blank keyboard. It has the little notches on the F and the J. I hope that's J. Is that J? Now I'm questioning myself. Ah, it's the J. Um, but it's completely blank. The amount of people, and I used I used to use this at work. I used to use this. At, I've used this at every job I've ever worked to. I can leave my my computer open, and nobody will come and mess with it because they can't type without being able to see their keys. They don't know, and they they fumble over. It. So even the thing of buying keyboards that don't have writing on them can sometimes act as a, as a deterring mechanism. So I don't have a cactus on my desk, but I have a keyboard that none of my roommates can use. So that's pretty funny. Um, okay, does the admin access configuration dialogues like in Windows reduce the necessity to separate user and admin account at your point of view? Yes, the, the, the keyboard was upside down, but it still had no writing on it, whether it was upside down or right side up. Um, Reduce the necessary. So, I mean, it depends. If your account is an admin and it comes up and says, you must be administrator to do this. Do you want to be admin? Yes. That didn't really change anything. That didn't really do anything. Um, ooh, looky there. It's showing up on the screen. So that didn't really that didn't really affect anything. Um, so I think still having an admin account is useful. Now, again, for your personal computer, the likelihood is you don't need this. I... I practice what I preach and I preach, I preach least privilege and don't get me wrong. It's irritating. It annoys me. I don't even really like it, but I can't sit here and give you this advice if I myself don't practice it. Um, and I'm one of those people that, like, if you've ever seen the XKCD comic where they, where you, they're talking about like NSA spying on your data and stuff. Um, I'm one of those people that is actively like trying to protect all of my data. And all I have is cat pics. Like, there's nothing like there is no valuable data on this machine. Um, nothing like I, like if you want my overwatch install, you can have it. Like there's like, I don't store very valuable data. Like I, I'm not, I, I, I'm very protective of things that do not need to be protected. So, but that's just me thoughts on physical USB NFC access keys to systems. Okay. I'm um, not going to answer that yet. That's another tip. So we're going to get to that. Like I, I'm going to come back to that question. That's literally going to be one of, one of the next tips. So great question. We'll come to that in a second. I am loving these little, the questions showing up on the bottom now. That's really awesome. The, uh, the magic moderator in the sky who tells me what to do um, is doing that. And that's, that's awesome. So tip number two, strong passwords. This is the best comic I've ever seen in my life. This is my favorite, one of my favorites. This one in Bobby drop tables. Um, and this a hundred percent explains password complexity. We have created passwords that are difficult for us to remember and are very easy for computers to guess because they're short. When you just do correct horse battery staple for random words, and it's a lot more difficult. As you can see, it takes two, two to the 44th, 550 years at a thousand guesses a second. Very difficult to guess. And you've already remembered it because it's a phrase. All of my passwords are either that random hash or they are phrases. That's exactly what they are. What they are is they're actually quotes from books that I like with um, with random leet in their leet code. So like I will replace a, a zero with a O with a zero sometimes. Because if you just do words and you just do phrases, you open yourself up to dictionary attacks and rainbow table attacks. Um, but by taking correct horse battery staple, for example, say we put that first E, we change it to a three. We change the A in battery to the at sign and we change the S and staple to a dollar sign. We've eliminated, we've, we've pretty much effect, effectively eliminated that classification of attack. Um, maybe they're checking for special characters in some places. It makes it difficult. Add an uppercase here or there. Um, th in my mind, those are the most strongest passwords you can create. But as you can see with this Troubadour one, like that, that's so awful. It's a terrible password. And it's difficult to do. You're like reaching all over the keyboard to get at it. And it's not strong. It looks strong, but it's not because, I mean, yes, you've you've now introduced more characters inside of the brute force attack, but not as many as you think. Um, so at two to the 28 bits of entropy, three days at three days at a thousand second guesses a second. Plausible attack on a weak, weak web service says yes, cracking a stolen hash is faster 
but it's not what the average user should worry about. So again, this is my this is the one of the best comics. It explains it the great way. Strong passwords. Um, a friend of mine, actually, I called him my evil twin because we were born on the same day, same year, and we both play trombone, like we met at a band camp one year, and it's just weird. Um, is also in security, which is we again evil twin, but he does offensive security and he has a great um presentation down here called statistics will crack your passwords and it's in my sources where he talks about like how I, i'm not i'm gonna i'm gonna some people are gonna feel a little seen from this statement um there's uh let me think i'm oh, sorry my I, I squirrel um how many people here like you you have a password you type in your password and it's like needs an uppercase letter so you uppercase the first one needs a needs a letter so you add numbers to the end needs a punctuation mark exclamation point at the end how many people have that like you don't have to admit it but just think that's what happens whenever you tell people these requirements they uppercase the first letter because that's what that's what probably what their grammatical speaking system teaches them to do in english the first letter of a, of a you know things are capitalized so we do that we don't randomly capitalize the middle letter um you want to add a number well most people don't really like leet speak unless they're geeks so they just add it to the end or the beginning and then a, a, a number of a, a punctuation mark. Most people don't use some of the more complex ones. So they just go with an exclamation mark. And that's where it's like, he, this is a great talk and a great uh, study on how many people have passwords like that and how they're able to crack them. So it's in the, like at the end of this uh, slideshow, I've got a list of all of my sources. You can read all of the articles that I referenced in here and you can view this. So, okay. Let's see what we have here. Okay, so thoughts on USB? We're going to do that one. Uh, why do platforms don't forbid, forbid dictionary keywords as passwords? Um, because no one would have... Because then how would we have password as our password if we couldn't use dictionary words? Uh, <laughs> um, because you want... Because, because then otherwise they'd only have random hash letter passwords and no one would ever remember their password and they'd constantly be resetting their password and that would become difficult it's not a bad thing to let people use dictionary words this this dictionary word like thing is still better than password or qwerty or admin one two three um it's just it's slightly weaker because of the fact that it is kind of vulnerable to a dictionary rainbow table attack but it's not that bad like this is still better uh, this is still better than the one above it even if it is just pure dictionary words, the likelihood of that getting compromised is very, 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 very low. Um, but the way to make, to add a couple more varies to that, add a letter or two in there, add a, add a number or two, swap some things out, do a little bit of leak code, add an exclamation mark at the end if you want. Um, it's not a bad, not a bad thing. It's just, um, yeah. So that's where that, that, that's how it is. So most people won't ban dictionary words text because most like 90, I would, I would, guess 99.99 percent of the population does not use random hash passwords and can memorize them it's a very small i would say it's a very small subset um samantha says does anyone else spot the trombone easter egg <laughs> um if bitlocker encrypted disk is on when i turn it off and i and i want to turn it on again will it produce a new encryption yes it should i've never done it but it should you encryption should produce it should produce a new key um and all of that because if it didn't that would be that would be bad that would be bad uh yes it should produce a new one uh thoughts on generated passwords from password managers like one password i use them all the time it's honestly i there's the password manager like random password generator that i use it all the time those are those are strong um it's stronger than what i can come up with and then i will do something from there um but yes i i love pass from password managers like one password i love i love randomly generated passwords um they those the those tools are using strong crypto strong crypt strong cryptography that was difficult to say for some reason um and they are protecting it and it's pretty and they're they're they have good systems unlike like in cracking the seed on that would be very tough um but yes i trust them i i i, th I think they're fine i i, I yes I trust them. I, I don't remember if those are open source if, or not. I think one password is open source, but I can't remember. Um, but yes, those are those are fine. And if you don't like, I use I use there's online password generator. It's a website. You can have it where it's all in JavaScript, so you can even have it like there's a checkbox where it doesn't generate on a server. It generates on the local machine, and that's what I use for random passes, passwords, and hashes all the time. 
why don't you open a 16 rem i'm i'm confused by that question i didn't understand it seems like the most single important aspect of password for security is its length for certain attacks yes length is one of the few length is never like the length of a password is never given the credit that it deserves it length is honestly in my opinion probably the most uh the most important thing when it comes to passwords because think about think about key encryption think about public private keys if you if you create a public private key that's i don't know 128 bits like a, an rsa key that's easily broken by by computers not by my brain by computers um we even don't recommend using 1024 rsa keys anymore because it's not a long enough bit length we recommend 2048 but in reality i use 4096 um and I what's the 8192 81882 I've thought I've even thought about going to those so yes length insecurity has a lot to do with a lot of it uh, in the password and the key length and the bit length so yes it is very important I know that you personally have qualms with password managers for those who decide to use them how can we make password managers more secure I don't have qualms with the, I you're, yeah, I do um the pa so the passphrase you use needs to be 64 characters or longer and if you want to use a favorite phrase from a book, do it. If there's a quote from something that's been living in your head rent-free forever, use it, lead it up a little bit, change an O to a zero, change an E to a three, add a, change the A to the at percent, and use that. If you're going to use a password manager, and I highly recommend that people do it, I don't recommend against using password managers. My brain just doesn't like them. I recommend that most people would use them if you're not like me and can remember 64 hashed kept passwords. Um, and eventually one day, like I'm like, I'm still relatively young as I age, that ability is going to go away and I'm going to move to a password manager. I'm just banking on the young brain right now. It's not going to last me forever. And I know it, um, make sure that that single password man that you have is the most secure thing you can think of. Um, and do not change it often. That's the biggest thing about password policy that gives me such anger is that like, and I used to do this when I was at work, when I worked at many different companies, um, I, my, I take a lot of time creating my passwords. Like whenever I change passwords, it takes me, it could take me a couple of hours before I think of one that I really like that I know I can commit to memory that I can do. Um, so making me change my password every 90 days really pisses me off. So, and if you have a strong password, you don't need to change it unless you think you've been compromised. But in reality, what happens is the likelihood is, is that it's actually relatively difficult to compromise some of these passwords. But by making people change the password so often, they don't opt for very secure passwords. They opt for password one, password two, password three. I actually worked at a company where the, wi the guest Wi-Fi was literally the name of the company and then the number for the month of the year, which I guess isn't terrible for guest Wi-Fi, but I could still probably drive up and go park in their parking lot and connect to their guest Wi-Fi right now if I wanted to. So yes, if you're going to use a password manager and you want to make it secure, use uh, you that 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 master password, that primary password you have, make it the strongest thing you can think of. Uh, your views on Google Chrome's password manager, is it safe to auto-save in Chrome? Mm. <sighs> That's a hard one. Part of me wants to say no. Part of me wants to say yes. I I believe I believe in Chromium. I believe in the Chromium project and the open sourceness of it. But we have seen. I think whenever we had, what was that? What was that vulnerability where they were using the just in time compilers, the JIT compilers to, uh, to exploit and steal data from Chrome. You know, I'll be honest. I use it. I use it in Brave. But I use Brave, so let's let, let me let me be clear. I use it in Brave, and Brave is only on one PC. Like Brave doesn't Brave is a security enhanced version of Chrome um, that basically block blocks third party scripts. So like I can I can block JavaScript, I can block all these trackers and stuff, and it's just done at the browser level. Um, but it doesn't have profiles, so they're saved in my Brave browser, but they're only on this machine. Um, but you know, if there's there if they're part of Google, if if it's if it's part of Chrome, then I'm not sure. But if it's part of like Google's accounts, like the Google password manager and stuff, Google's done a good job. Like they've given me no reason to really not trust them. Something in my mind makes me a little bit just it it feels feels weird. 
but I'm not going to discourage you from doing it. I understand the easy easiness of it, but just know that if you allow for autofill passwords and you leave your laptop open, now everyone has those autofill passwords. Everyone can use them. Um, and I, to my knowledge, Chrome doesn't make me verify them. At least with like something like one password or LastPass, um, it makes me like periodically log in every now and then. Google Chrome's passwords don't. So if someone were to compromise your machine, get in and then just open Chrome, would they have access to all of your bank account information because it's saved in Google Chrome? And are you okay with that? That's the question you have to ask yourself. But it's also like, what's the likelihood of someone getting on your computer and doing something nefarious? Is it low? Then maybe the risk is worth it. It's all about risk assessment. That's security is like 10% code and 90% risk assessment. Um, cool. Some account password leak with data. Some account password leak with data breaches. So it's better to use a dummy password and then an authenticator app two factor to secure myself. Two factor auth is literally the next tip. We'll get to that. I used to work for high opt higher education institution. They opted for ninety days force changes a few years ago. It was determined most people just reuse the same password and append a number. Exactly. Yes, hundred percent. Seen that article. Done that research. I worked in higher ed for a while. <laughs> I feel your pain. Um, the policy was changed just a year later. I have about 300 passwords. How to remember them without writing them down. Okay, I'm about to really... I'm about to say the thing that everyone's going to get angry about, but it's going to be... Uh, I actually am not opposed to writing passwords down. But let me clarify that with saying, I don't write my full password. I write a hint. Because I, have, I do have a few repeated passwords. Okay, like there are a few, um, for example, my streaming services passwords are all the same. So that way my family can log into them and they don't have to worry about them. Um, and because I also, I, I do a risk assessment. What is the worst thing that someone can do if they steal my Netflix password? They can maybe change my plan and cost me 20 extra dollars a month. They're like, But I'm already paying for the highest plan because I'm the Netflix person in my family. Um, they could put their own credit card and pay for it for me. Ooh punish me. So for those, that's a low risk assessment. Now my bank account, what's the worst thing someone could do if they got my bank account password? A lot. So I, those are strong passwords. Very, very strong. Um, so I leave myself hints. I write things down. Like I have a little book that is sitting in a, in a, in a, in a safe that I have where I write my passwords down because some accounts I don't use that often. I like, uh, checking stocks and stuff, you know, i look at that once a year. I don't remember that password. I don't remember that username. So I don't mind writing them down. Um, it's actually weird because like, you know, don't write them down and leave them on a sticky note taped to your monitor at work. But if you have a secure location within your home that you can store passwords or even not even secure, it can be hidden. I don't really see a problem with that. Like I, like there's a, like the likelihood of someone breaking into my house and stealing my stuff is really weird, is really low, really low compared to someone phishing me or someone social engineering me or someone um, corrupting a site and stealing a password there. I've had that happen where I've had a password get, get I cat password become compromised because it came from another person or because it came from another site. That site got compromised and everywhere I use that password now is, it was compromised. So, uh, so yeah. That's, that's it. So I'm not against writing things down, but don't like write out the full password. But if you know, like the password, like leave yourself some hints, as many hints as you need. If you want to write down the full password, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be grudging for it. Don't leave it at work. Make sure that that, that that device is secure and all of your passwords are in one place. Um, I actually used to do, where are they at? They're in my, they're in my closet and I can't. Uh, so I have like, these really cool toys that are like hand encryption machines. They're, they're called like enigmas. They're not really an enigma machine, but it's, it's gears and you can encrypt stuff and they're fun. Um, and I actually used to encrypt it with that and that device. Plus that I was the only one that knew how to do it. It would take a lot to get into. It. So anyway, I could digress. I could talk about password security forever. It's a topic that I'm very passionate about. I learned the other day that each Senator Congress person is responsible for their own IC security with no central standard. How would you educate them on at least performing a risk assessment? Ooh. <laughs> okay. Um, how would I, I, I would just, I would just educate. I would, I would bring them with like statistics, like the statistics will crack your password. And like, I would, I would just inform them that, you know, 
the world is changing. The world has changed, but it's it will ever more it's ever more changing. Passwords are becoming ever more and more insecure. Um, you must have two factor authentication. That's going to be tip number one. Um, that's tough. How would I educate them? I, I I would sit down and just try to educate them, and I would try to explain to them the gravity of the situation, and the gravity of what happens. You know, whenever things go wrong, take some of these other like like take just I would say take articles of other of other um, examples of breach because of password, and then show that the, the devastating damage that can be done to a company by that. And then enforce them that that they're in charge of national security secrets. That these are that they they have there is so much more to lose if they get compromised. Try to just express the gravity of the situation to them, uh, and then you know go from there. That's what that's what I'd say. Uh, I write my passwords in a GPG protected text file. What about it? Oh, the the oh, GPG protected text file is, in my opinion, that's the OG. Um, that's that's the uh, that's the OG password manager is one great passphrase and GPG protect the key. That's not a bad thing either. I've I've known a lot of people that have done that. Where would you keep your GPG private keys? Um, I keep I have a I have. <laughs> where would I keep them or where do I recommend keeping them? Because I'm a little weird. Um, I have multiple flash drives with the GPG private key that are encrypted flash drives that are hidden in various locations in places that have relevance to me, my parents' house and stuff like that. Um, actually one is within like, a, like safety deposit boxes is a good one. Um, again, I'm doing a lot of effort to protect no valuable data, but it's kind of cool. And it makes me feel like a spy when I do it. So, um, safety deposit box, put it on, a, put it on a, put it on a, uh, flash drive, find a safety deposit box at a bank, put it there. That's a great way to do it. Um, if you have like a a like a safe in your house, whether it's a fireproof safe or um, any sort of safe, I would keep them in there. Oh wow, getting a lot of questions. I'm loving this. Um, I'm gonna pause on the questions real quick. I'm gonna get to the last slide, and then I will come back to the questions because um, I do know that we're coming up on time. So number one tip: use two factor authentication. Use it. No questions. There's no, there's no, but someone says, but, and I go, no, push two factor. Always, always two factor off. Identity can be determined by one of the following things. Something, you know, something you are, something you have, something, you know, is your password and your passphrase. That's one authentication factor. So you need to have multi-factor something. You are fingerprint, facial scan, retina scans, something you have, YubiKey, rotating passcode, SMS messages. To be honest, I am still very weary of uh, biometric scans, which is the something you are. Fingerprints, facial scans, retina scans. Um, the technology has gotten remarkably better. But I remember being an undergraduate security class and they're like, these have been like, they the old school ones, you could fool with a picture. They've gotten a lot, lot better. Um, I don't want to give my data to them. My facial data, my retinal data, my fingerprint data, like, I don't trust that. However, I've already done it all. I'm a public figure who speaks like this, so it shouldn't really matter to me. Um, so I always opt for something you have, which is an YubiKey, which is a question that I had earlier. Someone was asking about YubiKey. Yes, I recommend having them. Rotating passwords, Google Author RSA tokens. I love Google Authenticator because they finally added the feature that I wanted. I can, and I know other things have this too, but I like Google Authenticator. I can scan it and I can have it on two devices. So I have one device and a safety deposit box and a safe. Um, that has all of my Google Authenticator codes on it. And then I have my personal device because may, I I have never felt so much fear as whenever my personal phone bricked and boot looped and I lost access to all of my third, all of my two-factor auth accounts. Luckily, I had the backup, but I've had it happen before. You want to be wary of, you want to be, you want to have a backup of those. SMS messages, be wary. SIM jacking is a thing. Um, Sim jacking is where someone pretends to be, they social engineer you. All these things you're talking about, they find out that your first dog's name was uh, Santa Claus and Santa's little helper, Simpsons reference. And they go to AT&T and they're like, I forgot my password. And they're on the phone with this, the support representative. And the, you tell them the passes and they get in and they transfer your SIM card to an, your, your phone to another SIM card. And now they have your text and now they can two-factor off against you. I have had personal friends lose Twitter accounts 
that had very popular Twitter names because of simjacking. Simjacking is a weary thing. I'm very weary, wary. I might have spelled it wrong. If I did, I'm sorry. Um, I'm very, very cautious when it comes to that. Unless you use something like Google Voice, like I do. And then if I only have SMS, I use Google Voice because my Google Voice is not attached to a SIM card. It's attached to a Gmail account that's behind a two-factor authentication method just like this. Then I will accept it being used. Uh, but yes, as it says, this this one, majority of Microsoft 365 admins don't, in fact, don't enable MFA. These were all um, news articles. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just do the closer. And then, well, actually, no, we'll go back to here. Um, magic voice in the sky. Leave me a private chat to let me know when I need to go away. And not, I'm going to try to answer all the questions that I have here. Um, so the person who had the YubiKey question, I hope I answered it. Uh, thoughts on physical YubiKeys? Yes, love them, use them. Um, I don't have one because I'm just lazy and haven't done it yet, but I do use two-factor off. Uh, do, 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 do. Can you use mnemonics, mnemonics to create stories to remember and create these passwords? Yes, all the time. That's the best way to do it. That's the only way you're going to remember it. That's how I remember mine. Um, if you don't do that, you're never going to like, or maybe put it to a tune or something. Or if you're one of those people that knows how to do like uh, mind palace, like mental, like can do those memorization tricks, like the reading off the credit cards and the numbers and stuff. Um, those kind of mental tricks, those are really cool. Uh, but yes, you're gonna, if you're going to have a ha random hash password, that's very long. The only way you're going to remember it is you're going to use mnemonics or you're going to use some sort of mental, like mentalist trick. Um, it's like it's actually funny that the mentalist tricks that are used to remember your passwords are the same ones that are used by magicians in magic shows. I love that. It's a cool fact. Is it okay to use weak passwords if you have 2FA set up everywhere? That's a fun one. Um You know? I can't, you know, I want to say no. But I can't think of why I would say no. If two-factor auth is working everywhere, if you have to verify your identity and you know that that two-factor auth is not going to be compromised, like it's your phone and someone, like if they stole your phone, then I get, I, I guess like it's more, is it, is it like more okay than using strong passwords in two-factor auth? No. Is it less okay? It's better than not having two-factor auth. Two-factor auth can, two-factor auth does add a sort of forgiveness to bad passwords. However, if someone were to compromise the two, the account, the device that has the two-factor auths, and they're trying to get into your account, then it would be easier for them to get into their account. Again, I would say that almost every single person in this call and that's watching this, that ever watches this, will probably never deal with the level of espionage that has to do with it. This is the kind of stuff that senators, CEOs, those kind of large companies, these kind of people may have to deal with this. Um, so it's good for them. But like the likelihood is, is that you won't deal with it but it's about being vigilant. Um, what can we do if our ISP leaked our secrets? <sighs> How would the ISP leak the secrets? Um, you're talking about like your personal data? Because like, unfortunately with that, your only options are get another ISP or change your DNS servers and don't use their DNS and use a secure DNS service like Cloudflare. I think it's like 1.1.1.1 where because like if, if you're going to encrypt a trap into encrypted sites it's very likely that the isp can't see what's happening what they are selling what they are knowing is they're looking up your dns search records so when you say when you go to a new site they've got the they're using they're using sorry you're using your their dns stuff um they have that information so your option is to go into your router and and recommend using a and use a different and you and honestly use dns over https because dns is not encrypted like the 1.1.1.1 and the new H DNS over HTTPS movement is new, but DNS was unencrypted. So even if you were using external ones, they could still see the data. So you have to kind of deal with that. Um, how do I back up my Google Auth? How do I back up my Google Auth? Oh, Google, literally, you're talking about Google Authenticator. In the app, there's an export all things. Get another device. And like another Android device or the iPhone device, install Google Authenticator, import, export. You scan a QR code, you get all of your things, and now you have two devices with the same codes. That's how you back it up. Uh, 
Glad that you enjoyed the event. Very informative session. Thank you very much. It's my first time joining your tech talks as a form of entertaining. Thank you. Awesome. I'm glad you liked it. Um, as you can see, I'm a little scatterbrained. Sometimes my, my thoughts go in all which way. Very informative. Very helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, last slide. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Mason Egger. If you want to hear more of these things, I, I post funny things. I, I, if you want to see more of my blog posts, more of my tutorials, I post all of the content that I create. I do a lot of content creation. So feel free to follow me on Twitter. Be on the lookout for more DigitalOcean workshops like this. Um, more tech talks. So I'm looking for one thing real quick. Um, okay, yeah, more tech talks. Every last Thursday of the month is typically when I do it. I know this isn't the last Thursday of the month, but we had some we have something going on in, uh, at the company that I was I had to do it now. Uh, if you want to try out DigitalOcean, there's you don't don't worry about that link. We'll send you a link in an email. Um, next, my next tech talk will be keeping your sites and users safe using SSL. We're going to talk about SSL. We're going to talk about TLS. We're going to do. We're going to go through in a deep dive. It's actually going to be a much more technical talk than this. We're going to go in a deep dive into SSL, TLS, and that level of encryption. Um, if, if you have questions, keep at, dropping them in the chat. I will be able to, uh, I can't answer them right now cause I do have to go, but I, it, we will put them in a Google doc. And when we send out an email, if you registered for this, um, you will get an email out saying, uh, with, with the talks and stuff. If you don't, you can find this tech talk on the page. Um, if you go to do.co slash tutorials or go to the digital tutorial page and you just search for this tech talk, just look for top 10. It should show up and we'll also post it there. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, I had a great time. I love the amount of presentation that we, uh, the interaction that we had today. And I hope that you'll come and see me again next time. I'll see y'all next month where we talk about SSL and TLS. Have a good day.